Have you ever heard someone make a statement like this? It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. This, of course, reflects the personal philosophy of many in our day and time. But have you ever stopped to think about what this is truly saying? Is sincerity some sort of magic that makes something true? Is the fact that I believe in something enough to make it just as valid as anything else? And if this is really true, then it should apply equally in every area of life, right? I mean, what if a nurse in a hospital gives someone medicine that causes them to become violently ill and die? Does the fact that the nurse sincerely thought it was the right medicine make it okay? Or what about the man who hears someone in his house in the middle of the night and pulls the trigger on his revolver only to discover that it was his young daughter sleepwalking? Does the fact that he sincerely thought it was an intruder make everything okay? If you want to drive to Chicago... It does not matter how sincere you are, if you are on the road to Los Angeles, you are not going to get to Chicago. Listen, it takes more than sincerity to make something right. And when it comes to false teachers, they may sincerely believe they are right, but their sincerity does not make it so. They may be sincerely wrong. And as we continue our study of Jude this morning, we come to a strong warning in verses 5 through 7 for all apostates. And as I have said, this epistle is all about apostasy. The key verse is verse 3. We are in a war to protect the truth from false teachers and false prophets. And this epistle is focused really not on the attacks that come to the church from the outside, but from those who come from within. And these are the more subtle and devastating attacks because we often hesitate to stand against those who claim to know the truth. We hesitate to stand against any who would claim to be a Christian who is on the inside of the church. And yet the Bible is replete with warnings about false teachers and false prophets. And we know they have infiltrated the church at every point in history. We also know from Scripture that it is going to get much worse as the days draw near for the return of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, that is the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. There's going to be a great apostasy unlike the world has ever seen at the very end of the age. But until that day, there's going to be continual apostasy in the church. So we have to be vigilant, and we have to be discerning, and we have to take a stand for the truth. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, The Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. There are going to be many falling away from the truth, and Satan's going to provide the substitute. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth, and they'll turn aside to myths. Apostasy, as we have seen, is characterized by a denial of the truth. And Jude talks about some who have turned away 
from God's truth. In fact, we're told back in verse 4 as they're introduced that they are those who have long beforehand been marked out for condemnation, for judgment. And you might wonder why Jude starts off with this theme of condemnation instead of leaving it until the end, but it's as if he's so eager to warn these apostates that he puts it right up here at the beginning. There may still be some hope for those who have turned away from the truth if they have not become too hardened in that. So before Jude even tells us who they are, he indicates they're going to be judged. They're going to be judged. And in verses 5 through 7, he gives some illustrations of what that judgment is to be compared to. He gives us three illustrations of God's judgment, and he utilizes this to warn all apostates. Let's just read back through this so we can get it clearly in our minds. He says, now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Here he points to three examples of God's judgment. He, he gives here the illustration of the Israelites who failed to believe in God. He gives the angels who became incarcerated in the abyss. He gives uh, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who were destroyed. Now, we need to compare this passage with 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9, because these two passages really, in essence, are connected. So turn with me for a moment to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter 2. Second Peter 2, and let's read this passage for comparison here, beginning in verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he had brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Interestingly, Peter uses two of the three same examples that Jude uses. He talks about the judgment of the angels and the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. He replaces the unbelieving Israelites with those who were destroyed by the flood. And Peter also includes, along with this warning of judgment, the encouragement that God also knows how to deliver the righteous. Jude doesn't include that emphasis. Now, we may compare these two passages in greater depth as we go along, but 
Going back to Jude now, let's examine these three illustrations. I'm going to outline it this way. The doubters, verse 5, the demons, verse 6, and the depraved is verse 7. So let's begin with the doubters. Go back to verse 5. Now, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all. Stop right there for just a moment. What Jude is saying here is, he's saying you already know this. He's saying, I'm just reminding you of something you already know. And all of us this morning already know these things. These Old Testament accounts were very well known to the Jews. The first one, the story of Israel in the wilderness, was perhaps the most frequently retold account in all of the Old Testament. Why is that? Well, because it's an illustration of God's redeeming love. The story of the Exodus was the most loved of all the Old Testament events. It is symbolic of God's redemption, and it of course, became memorialized in the Passover. So Peter is pointing them back to something they already knew very well. But it now becomes an illustration of apostasy. In fact, here you see the entire nation becomes apostate. And as Christians in the 21st century Uh, We really don't have to spend too much on this account either because we all know it very well. It is recorded for us in Numbers 13 and 14. I'm sure you remember it. After powerfully delivering the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, God had led them out to a place called Kadesh Barnea, He had just destroyed the entire Egyptian army by drowning them in the Red Sea after the entire nation of Israel had gone across on dry land. They are right on the verge of crossing over into the promised land, but a terrible thing happened. The Lord instructed them to send out some spies into the land. And his intention was for the spies to bring back word on how they could begin their attack. But instead, they came back with a report that all the enemies of the land were like giants and they were all like grasshoppers in their sight. And so they shrank back in fear and would not trust the Lord except for Joshua and Caleb. What happened to them? Well, God judged them for their unbelief. Now, he did not kill them all right there on the spot, but he declared, none of you are going to enter the promised land. They would all die in the wilderness, and none of them would ever lay eyes on the promised land from 20 years old and up. They all died in the wilderness as many as three million of them. Their carcasses would literally fill up the desert, God said. In fact, turn with me for a moment to Numbers 14. Numbers 14. Numbers chapter 14. This is one of the most tragic points in the history of Israel. And it is the fruit of their unbelief. Numbers 14, look with me at verse 4. I mean, excuse me, verse 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. You know what they're crying about? They're crying about the giants. They're afraid of the giants. And notice what they're saying, verse 2. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. And why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? 
our wives and our little ones will become plunder, would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? What they're saying is they're so afraid of these giants, they just know they're going to go into the land and the giants are going to slaughter them all. They're saying it would have been better to stay in Egypt or it would have been better even to die in the wilderness. And even now, maybe it'd be better to go back to Egypt. We'll drop down to verse 20. Here we see God's response to all of this. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. Now what's happened here? <clears throat> Moses has interceded for them. So God said, okay, I'm not going to destroy them immediately. But he said, you have put me to the test, verse 22. You have not listened to my voice. Their unbelief and their fear of the enemy, in spite of having witnessed the mighty power of God, was going to bring about now severe judgment. Look at verse 22. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. They're not going to see the promised land. God says, I won't kill them all at once, but they're all going to die in the wilderness. And none of them, except for Joshua and Caleb, are going to go in from those 20 years old and up. Go down to verse 27. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they're making against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses shall fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Verse 33, and your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they shall suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness, according to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you shall know my opposition. God says, I'm against you. You're going to serve 40 years in the wilderness. You're going to be at 40 years in the wilderness until you all die in the wilderness. One year for every day that you spied out the land. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely, this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall be destroyed and there they shall die. This is what Jude's talking about here. This is the judgment of God. He's referring to their doubt and their fear in failing to trust God against the giants in the lands. Even after God had shown them his mighty power in Egypt with all the plagues, even if after he had miraculously rescued them from the Egyptian army and had shown them all the other mighty miracles like the uh, provision of water and a, a number of other things already in the wilderness, they were still unbelieving. So God is judging them. This is a form of apostasy. It is coming to the edge of the promise of God and then falling back. They are an apostate nation and they all together here fall away and they all together will receive the judgment of God. Now the author of the book of Hebrews also points to this same incident. So turn with me for a moment to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. 
Hebrews chapter 3, look with me at verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear my voice, hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's a reference to Psalm 95. But in this context, it is talking about those who are right on the edge of the salvation of God, but they're falling short of it through a lack of saving faith. And we saw this when we went through Hebrews. Verse 12 warns, take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. Don't do like they did in the Old Testament and fall away because of unbelief. MacArthur says there were some people in the congregation to whom this epistle was written who had heard the truth, they had known the truth, they understood the truth, and they were right at the edge of believing the truth, but they would not come to saving faith. And so the author of Hebrews is using this illustration to warn those first century apostates that they were doing exactly the same thing as those God judged in the wilderness. Look at verse 13, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Don't let the deceitfulness of sin harden your heart. Don't become uh, bitter against the truth. Don't turn away from the truth. You better respond with true saving faith while you have the opportunity. Now, folks, there have always been apostates in the church. There have always been those who are very close to the truth but fall away from it without genuine repentance and saving faith. But this is the first illustration that Jude uses here. And what we have to understand is that the Bible teaches that the hottest hell, the most severe eternal retribution is reserved for those who know the truth but don't embrace it, don't act on it. In Hebrews 10, 29, we read, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded, regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? The most severe punishment awaits those who know the truth but fall short of it. And folks, listen, it is a great privilege for someone to hear the gospel it is a, a great benefit to be under the proclamation of biblical truth. There are many, many people in this world today that don't have that opportunity. In fact, we are supporting missionaries who are going to people who have never even heard the gospel. But there's a great responsibility that goes with that privilege. It is only the grace of God that has allowed us that opportunity and it is the holiness of God that will judge us if we fail to respond to that truth with genuine belief. Listen, many people go to hell from a church pew. Not all those who are privileged to know the truth will respond to it with genuine saving faith. And their unbelief will result in the judgment of God just like it did in the Old Testament with unbelieving Israel. This is a terrifying warning for those who are so close to the promised land of salvation that they can see it, and yet they fall away from entering into it. That's our first illustration, and I know you're getting nervous. I'll speed this up a little bit. But we have a second one here, and that is that of the demons. The demons 
back in Jude, look with me at verse 6. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one because I've taught on this before. I might come back later and deal with it in more detail, but I've taught on this from 1 Peter 3, uh, not that long ago. So I'm just going to give you a summary version of it this morning. These angels here are fallen angels. They are, in Jude's perspective, apostate angels. These are the demons that are described in Genesis chapter 6, which were involved in marriages with human women and produced a race of unredeemable giants. This is one of the main reasons why God flooded the entire earth and wiped out the human race except for eight people. And even though this has been interpreted in different ways, I believe that is the only understanding that is in keeping with the text. And really, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that this is what is being referred to here. Now, Jude says they have sinned in four ways. First of all, they did not keep their own domain. That is, they moved out of their own realm. Secondly, they abandoned their proper abode. That is, they didn't stay where God put them. Thirdly, if you drop down into verse 7, you'll see that Sodom and Gomorrah is used as a comparison to what these angels did. I mean, look at it. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality. The term for gross immorality there is ek porneia, which is a compound word for fornication. You could see this as an extreme form of that. What these angels did was something like the gross sexual immorality of Sodom. And we know what that was. It was homosexuality. It was out of the normal course of nature, sexual activity. And then the fourth defilement is also in verse 7. They went after strange flesh. The Greek word is heteros, a different kind. They went outside their own realm and they lusted after a different kind of creature. And you know, it's kind of an interesting twist here because the men of Sodom lusted after angels and these angels lusted after women. Or to put it another way, the men of Sodom wanted to commit sexual sin with angels that appeared in the male form while these angels, fallen angels, wanted to commit sexual sin with human flesh of the female form. But they received the judgment of God for this horrendous sin. Jude says back in verse 6, he has kept them in eternal bonds, everlasting chains, under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Has kept is the Greek word toreo. It's in the perfect tense. This is past action with continued results. He locked them up in the abyss, way back in the days of Noah, and guess what? They're still there. And they're going to be there until the day they are ultimately judged and cast into the lake of fire. They're being kept under darkness, which literally means under blackness. Peter wrote, he cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Now, we could certainly <clears throat> call the pits of darkness where they are hell, although it is not the final lake of fire. And you know, if we had time this morning, we could go back to Genesis 6 and see why this is the best interpretation of this passage. But I don't want to get bogged down this morning in 
risk missing Jude's main point here, so I won't do that. They're referred to here as the sons of God in contrast to the daughters of men. That has to be a reference to demons, as it is in three places in the book of Job. And what ultimately happened was that some wicked demons inhabited the bodies of some wicked men and they impregnated women whose offspring were giant monstrosities. This was Satan's attempt to produce a race of unredeemable men, but God put a stop to it. He incarcerated these demons and put them in a bottomless pit and that put fear in the hearts of all the other demons because they did not want God to send them to the same place. In fact, we see this exact thing in the account of the gathering demoniac in the gospel of Luke. And you may remember the demons begged Jesus not to send them to the abyss, to the bottomless pits. But the whole point of all this is to illustrate the danger of apostasy. And in the same way that there was an apostate nation of Israel in the Old Testament, there were also apostate angels. And if God did not even spare angels, then he won't spare those who are apostates today. And then Jude gives a third illustration. We've already seen that in verse 7. But his third example is that of the depraved. Look at verse 7 again. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. As I said, Jude ties the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah very closely with that of the fallen angels. The essence and nature of their apostasy is the same. They both indulged in gross immorality, sexual sin. They both left their own domain and went after strange flesh. Now, you know this story very well. It's very familiar account in the Old Testament recorded for us in Genesis 18 and 19. In fact, turn with me to Genesis 19 for just a moment. Genesis 19. Genesis 19, let's pick it up in verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. These two angels were in the the appearance of men. They had just left Abraham to determine the fate of these wicked cities. And lo and behold, when they get there, Abraham's nephew Lot is sitting in the gate. Now that would mean he had some position of authority there as an elder. But in the account, we see where he has very little influence, even though he's a godly man. Let's keep reading. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Apparently, Lot knew who these men were. He knows these are holy angels sent from God. Now, we're not told how he knew that, but in some way, God had revealed it to him as we see from the text, and he bowed down to them. Look at verse 2, and he said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet, then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the open square. Now, Lot knew that was not a good plan, that was not a good idea, because he knew the men of this city. Verse 3, yet he urged them strongly So they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter, and they called to Lot, and they said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Now, we all know what that means. They want to rape 
these two angels that are here in the appearance of men. Verse 6, but Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Listen, he didn't have to explain to them that this was sin. He didn't have to explain this is wickedness. They knew that. There was the law of God that had been written on their hearts. There, no doubt, had been the teaching of the law of God, maybe from Abraham and even from Lot. They knew what God's standards of morality were, but they didn't care. They didn't care. Now, I'm not even going to comment on the bizarre thing that Lot did, did next, as he said, here, take my two virgin daughters and do to them as you wish. That's really sick in and of itself and shows Lot's lack of faith, really uh, the depravity here. But the point is that Lot knew that he could not allow them, these men, to rape these angels sent from God. But drop down to verse 9. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already he's acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break down the door. Uh-oh, there's trouble in River City. Verse 10, but the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. The angels struck them all with blindness and the amazing thing is, which shows the degree to which they are enslaved to their perversion, verse 11, they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. They've just been struck completely blind, but that doesn't even slow down their perverse lust. They're still trying to find the door so they can rape these men. And this was so detestable in the sight of the Lord that he rained down fire and brimstone upon these cities and destroyed them all. In one hour, they were all gone. Oh, but listen, that was just the beginning of their judgment because Jude tells us that they were then subject to the punishment of eternal fire. The fire that fell on Sodom was just the beginning of the fire they endured. So this is the third of Jude's illustrations to warn against the danger of apostasy. Folks, this is a very, very sobering message that we must understand. Apostates in our day and time are in every bit as much danger as those men of Sodom were. The book of Hebrews is filled with warnings like this, but it is something we should take very seriously. And this is the main reason, folks, why we must earnestly contend for the faith. We must plead with any who are close to the truth but have not yet made that full commitment to Christ. We must plead with them to repent and to embrace the Lord with true saving faith. Folks, this is not something to mess around with. This is a serious, serious warning. What about you this morning? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place of genuine saving faith? Or maybe you'd have to say, no, I'm, I'm here today and I, I know the truth, I've heard the truth, I understand all this stuff, but I haven't committed my life to Christ. I haven't gone all the way. I'm, I'm in danger of falling back, becoming an apostate. Folks, this is the warning. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because those who fall away will be judged by God. Let's pray together. Father, we pray You'd help us to heed this warning today. I pray that we would understand just how serious this is. And Lord, I pray that everyone here knows Christ as Savior and Lord. If there are any that do not, I pray that they would 
come to know Christ in saving faith, even today before they leave this place. And Lord, help us all to understand the urgency of this message, that we would be about warning those who have not yet come to the full truth, that they would not fall away. So Lord, help us with this. Help us to respond to it the way you'd want us to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna have some elders here near the front at the conclusion of our service. They're here to help you. If you need to receive Christ today, if you need to uh, follow in believer's baptism, you need to be a part of this church family, maybe you need a word of counsel or prayer, something that you're dealing with, maybe you need to recommit your service to the Lord, whatever it might be this morning, let's respond to the Lord in his word. We'll have these elders here at the front. Well, let's pray for Chris Jackson uh, and what this afternoon holds for him. I see Pastor Michael hasn't left yet, so that's good, and he can come lead us as we sing. But uh, in fact, before we do that, let me just pray for Chris. Can we do that? Let's just uh, lift Chris up to the Lord. Father, we just uh, are thankful for your grace. Lord, we, we are thankful for your provision Lord, we thank you that you answer prayer. And Lord, uh, we have been praying for Chris for a, a long time now. And Lord, sometimes we even get impatient, and yet we know it's always perfect in your timing and in your way. And so, Lord, we pray right now for Chris. We pray that as he undergoes this uh, surgery, that uh, would be successful. You'd be with the doctors. And Lord, we just pray that this would be something that would give him not only long life, but quality of life for a long time. So Lord, we again just praise you and we thank you for your gracious provision in this. In Jesus' name we pray.